Dragonflies belong at the top of a very short list of flying insects that we humans actually like. Fashioned out of stained glass and enamel, these vivid gossamer creatures have faces as ghoulish as a Grateful Dead album cover. When one of them moves, ping-ponging around like a grain of sand in a tornado, his erratic flight leaves our eyeballs and our brains ricocheting. Well, that's because we only see 60 images a second. A dragonfly sees 200 images a second. So what we see as dizzying action looks like slow-mo to a dragonfly. For him, the blink of an eye is half an eternity. His brain can deal with 200 images a second, and his reflexes match his quick eyes. He reacts, well, fast, in 30 milliseconds. You can get an inkling of the speed of their reflexes by watching one perching. Every few seconds, its head snaps as it tracks a passing bug and decides not to chase it. Or, in that 30 thousandths of a second, it might see a fly and be already gone and back about the time we're trying to puzzle out whether we just saw a fly. Those eyes may look like something out of a Japanese horror movie, especially sitting atop that hairy boxer's mouthpiece as they do, but his motorcycle helmet of a face begins to seem almost beautiful when you consider that each eye contains 30,000 facets. There is no such thing as a nearsighted dragonfly. 80% of his brain is devoted to his eyesight, and he probably sees better than any other insect. What's more, those tennis ball eyes see in practically every direction at once. He misses only what's directly behind his head or below him. A bird now, with only two eyes to its name, has to constantly jerk its head, checking every sector of the sky for an incoming hawk. Dragonflies also check for danger, but they can do it without a single twitch. And then besides that, these bugs pair their near-omniscient vision with unrivaled flight skills. They might well be the most masterful flying creatures on the planet. Lethal predators with a 95% kill rate. Three major adaptations make them into aerial wizards. First, their wings are connected directly to the muscles that move them. Well, duh, you say. Where else would they be connected? But actually, that arrangement is unique in the insect world. In other bugs, the wings connect to the body wall of the thorax, and that arrangement effectively cuts the speed of other insects in half. They all suffer a permanent detour on the road of flight efficiency, while dragonflies have federal highways without a speed limit. Now, while this difference in where the wings are connected is a huge asset, it's only one example of the dragonfly's speed freak engineering savvy. Here's another, the dark spot on the outer edge of each wing. At high speeds, his delicate wings begin to vibrate, but those dark spots are thicker than the rest of the wing, and they stabilize him enough so that the shimmy only kicks in at higher speeds. Perhaps the dragonfly's most important flight advantage, though, is that he has two sets of wings, which work independently of each other. The front wings are often a quarter out of phase. That lets the back wings pick up the rush of air from the front pair, thus boosting the bug's speed by 20%. And by adjusting each pair of wings at a variety of angles, it can hover, fly backwards, sideways, straight up or straight down, do a U-turn in reverse gear, rapid punch the air, or spurt off in just about any direction that takes its fancy. But that kind of excellence comes at a cost. For his radar eyes and swirling speed, the dragonfly sacrifices hearing, among other things. His world is silent, nor can he make any noise or smell a thing. What's more, these superlative flyers are practically cripples. Their legs are just for grasping perches. They can't walk. Well, these denizens of the air don't need to walk, but they can't swim either, and that's a skill they could use. I mean, they live inches above the water, constantly doing battle there with other dragonflies. 
but if they get knocked into the water deep enough so that their wings can't take them airborne again, they'll either drown or be picked off by a passing fish or turtle. It's ironic that they have to consider water life-threatening because during most of their life cycle they live underwater. Dragonfly offspring hatch from eggs laid in ponds or streams and live underwater anywhere from a few months to five years, depending on the species. When they finally crawl up a stem into the air and shed their last underwater exoskeleton, they wait for an hour for the final exoskeleton to harden and their new wings to dry. Then they're ready to dart off at top speed, swerving like a marauding fighter plane. And they know instinctively how to calculate the trajectory of a gnat or a wasp, a damselfly or a butterfly, so that they can arrive where the prey is going to be in a couple of seconds. But they do better than just arrive at the right spot at the right time. They get there just below and behind that spot so that their quarry never sees them coming. A 95% kill rate from these masters of ambush shouldn't surprise anyone. Those lightning reflexes also come into play as the male defends his few yards of shoreline. He thinks all the other males in the vicinity should just evaporate somehow, leaving him to commandeer every female that shows up. But since all the other males have that same attitude, fights ensue. And if either combatant gets knocked into the drink, it's not just the end of the fight. It's probably the end of that one's life. Maybe that's why their constant territorial squabbling doesn't include all that much actual body contact. They know that a lot of body slamming will eventually knock them into the drowning pool. Well, then you might ask, why don't they hunt over dry land? Females can, but males can't. Female dragonflies lay their eggs in fresh water, so that's where the males have to hang out in hopes that a female will wander by and they can grab her. And I do mean grab. Male dragonflies don't waste any brain space figuring out how to court females. They leave niceties like that to wimps like butterflies. No, these aerial buccaneers simply seize a female with the claspers they have at the end of their bodies. As soon as a male grips the female behind her head with his claspers, he bends his body under himself to transfer his semen to an accessible spot. Then the female bends her tail under herself to connect with that spot and... Yeah. Their aerial yoga is called a mating wheel, but it actually looks more like a valentine. Yeah, well, it's not true love. An entomologist will tell you that the male simply wants to pass his genes on. And I don't doubt that's true, but there's got to be more to it than that, because passing genes along just sounds clinical. Fortunately, nature knows how to jazz up anything so crucial to the survival of the species with intense sensual pleasure, about five minutes' worth of dragonfly lust. Five minutes is more than adequate because it's not like either one of the sexes hankers for a relationship. The female wants sperm donors, and the male, he just wants to be the last one to inseminate her before she lays those eggs. To that end, the males of some species continue to clasp the female as she lays eggs, letting go only long enough for her to drop a few eggs and then latching on again. In other species, the male merely dithers around nearby as she lays in hopes of running off any new suitors. Sex on the fly, whether it's territorial squabbling, mating, or egg laying, completely absorbs the dragonfly's attention. And the predators aren't napping during these shenanigans. Swallows swoop. Songbirds feed dragonflies to their nestlings. And there will be frogs mingling with the vegetation below the dragonflies, where they're often in the bug's blind spot. Frogs so still they don't blink for half an hour. Gargoyles that can come to life. 
Even if an adult dragonfly doesn't drown or get snapped up by a frog or a juvenile green heron, it isn't going to live very long anyway. By seven to eight weeks, its wings are tattered and the exhausted insect dies. Considering that for them the blink of an eye is half an eternity, they must cram a lot of living into those weeks, but still, they do have short lifespans. And I wonder how many generations of them have flitted over ponds during their 320 million year long existence. They were already landing on perches chewing on hapless bugs a hundred million years before dinosaurs came on the scene. But despite those two or three billion generations, their body design has scarcely changed. Because how are they going to improve on perfect? No, the main difference between today's dragonflies and their ancestors is that the current models are smaller. Back when the Earth had a more oxygen-rich atmosphere, some dragonflies had two-foot wingspans. But those days are eons gone. We'll just have to content ourselves with the 5,000 jeweled species of these miniature dragons that have evolved over the last third of a billion years.